So here we can see some news about standards, right? We have new corporate governance codes and guidelines from different countries. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about CSR today. Here they mentioned CSR, Dutch EU Presidency Conference on ESR. Uh, we have papers on corporate uh, governance. They give the lectures. So, again, here on this one, they have uh, trying to influence the policy. So, they have uh, assets under management of 26 trillion. Uh, with investors, who is members of this network, and they want to advance efficient markets and sustainable economies. The next topic we're going to talk about is sustainability. So corporate governance is also relevant to sustainability, right? those kind of things. Uh, we have to make sure the company is working in the right way. Okay. So, again, uh, we see here information about the Dutch and Japanese corporate governance. So just you can look at these websites if you want, in your own time. So, just we're going to look at this story on the BBC. So, open this story. Cowardly corporate lions, whatever happens, courage. So, we can see the picture from The Wizard of Oz. Do you like the movie The Wizard of Oz? Do you know the movie? was well, a famous movie from Hollywood, especially when we were younger. They always showed The Wizard of Oz on the TV. Uh, so, <coughs> let's read this uh, article <coughs> together. Okay. So, in a room full of smart and accomplished corporate board directors and chief executives from leading companies around the world, one topic resonated above all the usual items on the table. It wasn't strategy, risk management or compensation. It was courage. Of course, that wasn't the word they used to describe their dilemma. It only became apparent that courage was an issue when I asked the executives what they do when there's something that comes up in a board meeting that they don't quite understand. It could be about technology, a competitor, a proposed acquisition, anything. So sometimes the board members don't have the education or the knowledge. They don't understand. Okay? So what do these smart, accomplished corporate directors do when something doesn't make sense to them? Right? Do they say, I don't understand? Normally they do nothing. Okay? So they just pretend they understand. They don't say anything. There are exceptions, you understand the exception? Not everybody, there are exceptions, but most directors tend to assume that if they don't understand the logic of a chief executive's argument or strategy, they are probably the only one. So it might be like in the class, some people might think, I'm the only one that doesn't understand. Right? Uh, so <coughs> I don't want to say anything, because everybody else understands. So actually in the class, if you don't understand something, I prefer if you ask a question. Because then maybe the other students don't understand either. Okay. So rather than be singled out, to be singled out means that people notice you. These people who are the last line of defense for shareholders, so they are defending the shareholders, they need to rein in. Rein in comes from horse riding. Pulling the reins means control. Reining means control. Out of control management teams. They shy away from asking the question they really want to ask. For super successful big ego, do you have a big ego? What is a big ego? Hmm? I think you're great. If you have a big ego, I, if you have a big ego, you think you're the best. The best in the world. Okay? So, many of you says here that many of the directors are like this. So acknowledging that you don't understand something can be embarrassing. So if you think you're the best and really great, it can be embarrassing to say you don't understand. 
better to play along and hope someone else will ask the question. So you don't ask the question, somebody else asks the question. Okay? This is the opposite of how a child behaves. When a child doesn't understand, they usually ask and they feel no shame. They just want to understand better. Somewhere along the way, all of us lose some of that natural inquisitiveness. We become more guarded, self-protecting and calculating. Okay, so we can lose this kind of innocent curiosity. So what happens when we lose this, but your job is protecting shareholders? Answer, you get the dismal state of affairs that exists in many companies, where effective oversight takes a back seat to keeping your mouth shut and getting along. So, a takes a back seat means is second, right? Like go in the back seat of the car, go behind, not as important, okay? So, how did the board of Hewlett Packard stumble through multiple CEOs before finally settling on Meg Whitman, losing billions of dollars in bad acquisitions and lost market share along the way? Okay. So they're saying that they didn't, they didn't uh, work properly okay, because they lacked the courage. So when most acquisitions fail to create shareholder value, why do boards continue to approve deals that their CEO wants? Okay. Example, Boston Scientific buys Gideon at an exorbitant, very high price, leading to $4.5 billion in losses. Okay. And Microsoft bought a part of Nokia. Okay. So sometimes the CEO wants to make buy an acquisition. Right? Because they get more power. They're in charge of more things. But it's not good for the company. But the board of directors might not say anything. Okay? So they, they give another example here. Canadian telecommunications joint Nortel. Okay? Nortel's board approved a disastrous series of acquisitions that almost bankrupted the firm. Do you understand acquisition? What is an acquisition? What does acquisition mean? Can anybody tell me? The company by the small company. Yes. Okay, so they had a lot of bad acquisitions. So the, when they're making the acquisition, the board of directors has to approve, right? So the board of directors sometimes just accept what the CEO says and they don't think about it properly. So the price of cowardice. I've seen firsthand the price that shareholders, employees, and communities pay when the boards lack curiosity and courage. This person was an expert in witness in one of the Enron trials. They got access to confidential documents that had pre been presented by management at board meetings. So Enron's top executives ended up in prison. The company collapsed. The stock tanked and the employees were out of jobs and often had their retirement savings wiped out. So we already studied about Enron, okay? Caused a big problem for the communities and everybody. So from those documents, there is one sequence of events that stood out. Every quarter, the board would be given a pie chart that summarized the percentage of Enron's assets that were performing above expectations meeting expectations and below expectations or were troubled. This is a pie chart. Pie chart is like this. Okay, splits up the things. So quarter by quarter the board would see, as I did, how the percentage of assets performing at the above expectation declined, went down, while the assets in the troubled category increased. Then after five quarters, the report stopped. I searched for any document indicating the board received this information in successive quarters, but it wasn't to be found. The reports had just stopped. Okay, so why didn't the directors ask, where are the reports, right? A small child might have asked, why aren't you making those reports anymore? And what's happening to the assets, okay? But the board didn't ask about those kind of questions. So they. They said there are similar problems in many boards. Lehman Brothers in the financial crisis, Washington Mutual, WorldCom, GM. All the boards had opportunities to challenge 
what could have been deemed corrupt and high risk practices at each of these companies, but they didn't. Okay. <coughs> GM disregarded some problem safety problems that caused some deaths. Okay. So uh, the system of corporate government that exists in most countries in the world, and especially in Western economies, is the backbone of capitalism. Without appropriate oversight by an independent group of experts with fiduciary responsibility to protect shareholder systems, the entire system breaks down. So they say that capitalism, capitalism can break down if the board of directors are not doing their job properly, okay? If we don't have the proper corporate governance, okay? Uh, so small investors begin to feel like the system is rigged against them. So we talked at the start that one of the advantages of the joint stock corporation is that people can put their money together. Everybody can put their money together, okay? And by putting our money together, we can make big investments like railroads and so on, right? That's capitalism. Do you understand capital? Capital is like money or time, something we use. Capitalism is we put together and then we can use that to make good future, right? Do you know the farming? If you think about the farmer just using some, some uh, fork or shovel or buying the big machinery, right? Capitalism, buying the big machinery, okay, can make more effective because he gets a loan from the bank or people put their money together, okay? So we need, capitalism system it works well, but we need the corporate governance to protect the capitalism system. If we don't have that, then the system breaks down. So, unfortunately, despite the theory how boards are supposed to work, we say that the reality is messier. So in this case, they think the board should act with more curiosity and courage. Okay, so Stan Sidney Finston, who was involved in the Enron crisis. Okay. So we've seen, last class we saw the suggestion of network governance. Okay bringing in more people, more different boards from, and different groups from different areas of the company. Okay, and then in this case they say just the board of directors need to be more curious and more courageous okay, to question the CEOs. So do you have any question about this article from the BBC? Okay, so then let's move on to the next topic. We're going to start talking about CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. So just you're using the computer, so you guys try to find a definition. Try to find a definition and tell me, what is CSR? So you can use the computer to search Google. Okay, so discuss with your partner, what did you find? Discuss with your partner, what is CSR? What kind of definition did you find?
Okay. And the next one we can look for is ESG. Look for ESG. So what is ESG? Discuss with your partner. You can Google and search for ESG. Because we want to get familiar with the vocabulary first of all. In the US they like using abbreviation, so we have the abbreviation CSR and ESG. <laughs> What is uh, CSR? What is CSR? Can anybody tell me? What does CSR stand for, first of all? What's C? Corporate. corporate. What does corporate mean? Company. What's S? Social. What does social mean? Society. Society. <laughs> and last one? Okay, and then what about ESG? Environment, social, governance. Okay, so CSR is a voluntary, it's kind of a self uh, regulation by the companies. Do you understand self-regulation? We don't have much laws about that area, right? But companies decide to do that, um, that they can uh, regulate themselves and they will voluntarily look after the environment and society. Okay? Do you trust companies to do that voluntarily or not? What do you think? Do you trust companies to look after the co society and the economy voluntarily or you don't trust them? Hmm? Generally. You're shaking your head? Don't really trust them? Okay. But, you know, especially in the early 2000s, companies said, it's okay, you can trust us. Okay, we're going to do CSR. We're going to voluntarily look after all those things, okay? And then usually they report about this. They report about what they're doing. They use the GRI reporting. Okay, then this ESG is used more often in the finance community because this is for uh, inve usually investment managers the investment managers, when they're checking the company, is it a good company? Right? They ask the question, is it a nice company? Okay? And then they do some like testing in these areas. Okay? ESG, rating. They, all, they can company can get a rating. Okay? So we can see those two types of vocabulary. So, in this case, we're going to look at just uh, the green side, the environmental side of corporate social responsibility, just as an example for companies. So, we have some international treaties and agreements and national laws. For example, do you know the Kyoto Protocol? Kyoto Protocol. 
about the environment. Okay, but they are not. They are not. Uh, not all countries signed the Kyoto. Some countries didn't sign. Okay, and that kind of those international standards give kind of a minimum. Do you understand minimum? Minimum level. Basically, when they make international treaties and laws, it's very hard to make a strict law because some companies don't agree. Countries don't agree. So in the end, they tend to go towards the lower lower one to keep all the countries happy. Okay. <clears throat> Both companies or banks can implement voluntarily standards for their company investments and lending. So in this case, we're going to look at the difference between banks in developed and emerging markets. We're going to focus on banks and the environment. So what are the financial benefits of being green? Of what are the financial benefits of being a nice company? Okay? Can we get financial management benefits? What do you think? Is companies who get a good rating here, do they perform better than companies who get a bad rating? What do you think? Nice companies who protect the environment, help the local community, and have good governance, do they perform financially better than bad companies who don't care about the environment, don't care about society? Hmm? What, could you give me an example of a bad company? Bad company who's doing bad for society? Oxy, what do they do? They know the, some component of the, their product is harmful to. Ah, okay, that, that company, right? Okay, yes, that's an example of the company who was doing the bad thing, right? But traditionally, we can think of do you know casino? Casinos or tobacco? Somebody wants to come in? <laughs> so the tobacco industry, right? Are they doing tobacco industry doing good for the community? Cigarettes? Good for the community or bad? But my question is, did, can you tell me then a company which is good company, which is doing good for the environment, society? Can you think of a nice company? What kind of company is a nice company? They're doing something productive for society. How about a company which makes uh, some anything, right? Like milk, right? Company making milk, are they without damaging the environment, right? Nice company, they make milk, they're helping people to drink milk for their breakfast, okay? And they're nice, they have good governance, they help the community, they don't damage the environment, okay? So, can we say that the nice company is going to be more profitable than the cigarette company. Do you think we can say that? The milk company is a nice company, so they are going to make more profit than the cigarette company, which is a bad company. Is that true or not true? Hmm? No. Not true, why not? Uh, because, for example, uh, if uh, cigarettes are harmful, uh, so people cannot, don't uh, say uh, they are uh, continuing to smoke and uh, they buy the cigarettes and uh, give a profit to those companies and uh, maybe to some people it is essential or something like this. So you mean that it can make the same profit? Uh, yes. Okay. So again, it's hard to say. They do some studies and check. They give the rating to the company. You're a nice company or not nice company. You get a rating. 
and usually they make an index. Index means a group of companies. So they make an index with all the nice companies. And then they compare the index of all the nice companies against the normal index. Okay? Are the nice companies doing better than the not nice companies? It's hard to say. We talked about it in the same issue in governance. So many things affect the profit in a company. Okay? But we can't say we do get these be beneficial parts. We can improve our reputation. Okay? Better reputation. We're helping the environment. Risk management. Uh, so, the, for example, the price of water is going up. Okay? Or the government makes a new regulation about water. Okay, but our company already has a very good environmental process, so we don't use much water. So, we are not punished when the new regulation comes in. So we can manage that kind of risk. Or do you know CO2? CO2? So, maybe there's a new law about CO2. Okay? You need to pay a lot of money if you're emitting the CO2. Our company is a nice company, then we're ready. Okay, for the company who's not ready, needs to spend a lot of money, that's a risk. Attracting private investment. So, uh, nowadays investment managers are more concerned about investing in nice companies rather than not nice companies. For example, the pension fund in the UK, they won't invest in tobacco companies, in cigarette companies. Okay, they won't buy stock or a bond in the cigarette company. What about you? Do you care? If I give you an investment tomorrow, you can invest in the cigarette company or you can invest in the milk company. Do you, does it matter or do you care? About milk company is nice, cigarette company is bad. You're investing your money. Do you care whether the company is nice or not? Or just about profit? Hmm? You care about it's nice? What if you think the cigarette company will make 10% profit and the milk company will make 5% profit next year? Where are you going to invest your money? Milk? You only get 5%, you get 10% with the cigarette company, right? So, let's have a show of hands and see. Hands up. Who would, in that case, who would invest in the milk company? Milk company is 5%, cigarette company makes 10% next year. Hands up, who's going to invest in the cigarette company? Hmm? Okay, try again, milk company. So you guys are not that worried. What about if the milk company makes, you expect the milk company to make 5% and the cigarette company to make 5.1%? Where are you going to invest? Hands up, milk company. Cigarette company? Still cigarette company? Do you smoke? No? Okay. So we can see that investors, investors, anyway, they are a little bit, think a little bit about if the company is nice or not for the environment. Okay? How about if, if you can invest in Oxy and you can make 200% next year? Will you invest in the company? You make 200% because they had a crisis, their stock price went down a lot. So you think, now I can buy and I can make a big profit, 200% next year. I will consider. I'm going to consider. Okay. So we can see that investors have those kind of ideas. But nowadays a lot of investors take into account these factors when they invest in the company. Okay. Especially pension funds. Do you know pension funds? Pension funds. Government control, pension fund. Okay. So, we can see some studies here which showed that improving reputation has a correlation with financial performance and attracting and retaining employees. So who do you want to work for? Do you want to work for the milk company or cigarette company? Or don't care? Do you want to work, you don't care? Hands up, who wants to work for the milk company? Who wants to work for a cigarette company? Who doesn't care? Doesn't matter. Okay? But anyway, we can see there is some relationship from the studies. There are some people who prefer to work for a nice company. Okay? 
So we can see sometimes the salary in the NGO is a lot lower because a lot of people want to work there. They want to work for a nice company. So there's more competition. Okay, so they can give the lower salary. Uh, also, the uh, better reputation means better financial performance. You talked about the crisis. If our company has a bad crisis, then we lose money. People stop buying products. So we have a better reputation, people buy more product. So do you know McKinsey? McKinsey is a famous global consultancy company, right? They did this kind of study. Especially in emerging markets, uh, companies can get the benefit by being recognized as leaders. If they're a leader here, they can get more investment from the foreign investors. And it helps to avoid the scandals if we have a better reputation. Risk management, the more regulation can mean a big financial cost. Okay? So emerging market investment managers regarded risk management as the most important benefit. So especially in countries like China or Brazil, right? They don't have strong laws against the environment. So nowadays they're improving their law against the about the environment. So the com companies who are not prepared have to spend a lot of money to adapt to the new law. The countries, companies which are prepared don't have to spend as much money. Attracting investment, uh, we have green bonds, green index, green index products. Uh, we can call, we can see SRI fund. SRI is social responsible investing. So, socially responsible investing. So you just do the Google. You can also check in Down Finance if you want. Try to find the SRI fund. Okay, you do on Google. Can you find the SRI fund? I know there is an SRI fund that's sold in Korea. So you guys just try to find on the internet. Okay. Just type in SRI fund. You can type in Korean or English in this case, right? Socially responsible investing. So SRI fund. So try to find a fund. Try to find a fund. SRI fund, Honda in Korean. Did you find an SRI fund? Hmm? So as yet, in Korea, the market is not that developed, financial market, so they don't have that many SRI funds. But if you look in London or the US, they have a lot of SRI funds. Okay? SRI fund picks just a nice company. They're not going to have tobacco or other, other companies in their funds. Right? So... <coughs> Here we can see an article on uh, Forbes, right? They can invest some funds, right? Uh, so here we have five funds for socially responsible investing. Okay? So people these days are getting more concerned about socially responsible investing. So they can invest in a fund which has just, the fund just chooses the. Uh, nice companies okay so they they make their own usually the fund makes their own scale or they rate the companies on these things okay and then they decide this company is out they don't pass our test this company is in okay then only the nice companies that are in goes into our fund and then uh, they investors buy the fund. Okay, so here, for example, 
here's a, a large SRI bond which is deciding should we include Apple or not. Okay? Is Apple nice enough to include in our fund or not? Okay? So they make those kind of decisions. Some funds might include Apple, some funds might say there might be some problems, so we won't include them. So that kind of investing is growing. Okay, we have index products. Uh, index is group of stocks. People can invest in the index. Uh, so we have also bonds, those kind of things. So we have the principles of responsible investment. Uh, we can see here, it says we will incorporate environmental social governance issues into investment analysis and decision making processes. So uh, let's just look at the home page. So just type into Google UNPRI. So we can look at the home page. So just, this is a voluntary thing, right? Uh, we just make this kind of uh, <coughs> pledge. It's like making a promise, right? This is our promise. We make this kind of promise. We are going to incorporate this into our investment analysis. So when we are making investments, we are going to first check these things and use it to make a decision. And then they signed this. So a lot of companies joined the PRI. Okay? So uh, mo most of the large banks and investment companies in the world have signed. We can see here new signatories, right? Pathway capital management. So investment companies, right? Universities. So when it means when they invest money, they're going to think about all of those things. So if we go to the bottom here, we can see signatories. Bottom of the page, and we can click on signatories. Signatories means the people who signed that. Okay. So we have uh, a lot of asset owners, investment managers, and service providers. Total of 1,500 signatories. Right. So we can search by country. We can search uh, for Korea or another country. Let's say for example United States. <coughs> Where is the United States? I'm sorry, here. Not uh, here. Okay, United States. different types of companies and uh, for example investment managers if we click on so mo show more we can see a list of investment managers okay so we have wealth management industries right uh, there's 900 of them all of the most of the big banks are going to be included here okay it's in alphabetical order uh, so all of these people signed this document to say, we're, when we invest money, we're going to think about these things. So the UN, the UN organized that uh, voluntary standard. So what happens? Often, the international environment is like that. We don't make the law. The UN could make a law that everybody has to do this, right? But it's hard to make the law because all the countries have to agree to the law. So. Many countries don't agree to the law, so in the end what they may end up doing is making voluntary standard or principle. Okay? That's the kind of international system. Do you think that works well, that kind of principle system? Did you ever do an English camp? Did you ever take part in an English camp? Sometimes they make the students sign the document. I will not speak any Korean in the camp. Hmm? 
You did that? You did that? Did you sign the document? Did you speak Korean? No. Did it? Never? <laughs> so do you think it's a good system? That kind of system? People just sign the thing to say I won't do this instead of legal. It's voluntary, right? Do you understand the idea? Voluntary system where you sign. And then what happens? If companies don't follow this principle, just they take them off the list. Okay? They're not on the list anymore. Just they, they can get embarrassed, that's all. The only punishment is kind of embarrassing. So we can see there's a lot of money these days, which is under the principles of responsible investment. 60 trillion US dollars is a lot of money. Okay? So 75% of investors think about climate change information in their investment decisions. Okay? And if you study the financial management class, you'll know that institutional investors are important. Okay? I ask you the question, are you going to invest in the bad company or the nice company, right? But at the end of the day, you're probably not going to invest your own money. You're going to ask somebody with more knowledge to help you, like the stock trader, right? Or you're going to buy a fund. So in the end, the fund manager will be ma making the decisions rather than you, okay? So the institutional investors is important. Of course, you are a retail investor. Retail investor is important too because they push the uh, institutional investor to change their policy or change their product. So, other voluntary standards for companies on the environment. We talked about the ISO, International Standard Organization. They have a voluntary standard for environmental management systems. Okay? So, I want to make a management system, environmental management system in my company. If I join and follow this standard, I get an advantage because I get the information. The other companies who already have this system, they're going to help me. They're going to give me the information I need. Okay? And tell me how to do this, the know-how of how to implement environmental management system. Okay? Uh, we have the UN Global Compact Reporting Initiative, we already mentioned. All the companies do the same type of reporting in the same way. Again, organized by the UN. So I report about all of these things in the same way. And then the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. So this is a document which, the, oh, do you know the OECD? Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. We have about 31 countries, three as a member. Okay? So those countries came together and made guidelines. Is that a law? Is this a law that multinational enterprises have to follow? No, it's a guideline. You understand guideline. They should do this. Okay? Voluntary, voluntary, voluntary. Okay? If we do these things, we get stamp ISO 100, this. Okay? It's good for our reputation. We look better if we have those kind of uh, voluntary standards. Okay? We talked about for investors, the, this one. For banks, they also have special <coughs> voluntary standards. Uh, the equator <coughs> principles, which is uh, covers big, when the banks provide money to, for projects. So banks are very important because they provide a lot of money for projects. Okay? Like in China, they built a big dam for the hydroelectric uh, power. Where did they get the money? From the bank. So the bank can influence. So this uh, covers 85% of this financing globally. So many banks have signed up to these voluntary principles. Okay? So they, have, they follow these stages, like screening the project, is it very bad for the environment or not? Give it A, B, C, D. Making a social and environmental assessment. So the company has to say, how is this project going to damage the environment? If we build a dam, maybe it can damage the birds, can damage the wildlife, okay? can damage the local community. Then they make some risk management planning. How can we manage the risk? 
and then monitoring. After they do the project, they are checked by the bank. So the banks, when they are giving a loan, they are also thinking about the environment, those kind of things. Okay? But in some countries, the banks are not following this one, but most countries they are. So uh, then, let's uh, finish there for today. Do you have any question about what we discussed so far in the class today? No? Okay, then. See you on Thursday, or next week, Tuesday.